Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Low Season Traveler Insider Guides. I'm Kate Burgess. Lars is back today to teach me all about the culture in Andermatt, from different ways of eating cheese to how the devil built a bridge for the locals to cross the cursed gorge. It really is a fascinating place. Hope you enjoy. Hi, Lars. Welcome back to Low Season Traveler Insider Guides. How are you? Great, Kate. Good seeing you again. You too. So interestingly, Andermatt has been the subject of a 2019 documentary series chronicling the development of the mountain area from a military base to a popular tourist destination. Uh, The documentary is called The Awakening of the Mystic Mountains, which follows locals, residents and businesses in their daily lives. What is this connection and history between the military base and Andermatt? That's a good question, and it's something I think very important to understand the 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 making of Andamat and and becoming a touristic destination today. So basically, um, the the military development started, and um, it has to do with with the Swiss military basically deciding or seeing the potential of of the whole Gothard region, not only Andamat. There were um, there were several um, other villages as well to be a good um, stronghold against um, attacking forces. So the the idea basically they had was if if Switzerland would have been attacked during one of those world wars, they would have retreated um, up in the mountains and um, leaving like eight cities like, like Zurich basically un, unprotected. But um, on the other hand, being being almost um, yeah, invincible up in the mountains because it would be very difficult for any other um, troops to to yeah to attack them in in the mountainous region so that's why especially during the second world war they started um developing a lot of um fortresses inside the mountains so you you can imagine or or people often say the the mountains around andamat they are really like a swiss cheese there are a lot of holes in in the mountains around andamat um and um what i think is quite interesting that that even after the second world war the military actions did not did not stop completely because of, you had the, the cold war for one thing but also um the swiss military then used andamat mainly as a as a training and education ground for the for the mountain troops um, and so the military stayed in andamat until the 1990s so like 25 years ago which is i think not that that long ago it is um, not it is not long at all <laughs> Right. And, and you can imagine, I mean, that that uh, kind of hindered people coming from for touristic reasons, because you had a lot of military um, um, people always in Andamat. You didn't have a good touristic infrastructure. So um, Andamat was re- really um, yeah, living from from the um, economy um, that the military um, gave them. And, and it was it was good. But uh, on the other hand, they, they also did not really invest into touristic development and, and that's why when the military finally left in the 1990s <laughs> Andamat was uh, yeah a little bit um, shocked because they didn't really have a plan b and and that's why and you can um, I think see that quite well in this Mystic Mountain um, series that you mentioned um, the investor that then came to Andamat saw the potential of of developing Andamat into a touristic destination and and um, also, I think it's it's quite a unique project in, in within Switzerland to to really have the um, put, uh, the avail- availability to to turn a whole destination into uh, something new and then start developing um, not only hotels but like the whole infrastructure to to build a golf course to invest a lot into the ski resort and then to really uh, put Andamat on on the touristic uh, map within Switzerland. And to have that happen in 25 years is an uh, incredible achievement for Andamat. It shows what an amazing destination you are to be put on the map already and to be considered, you know, a great ski resort and a great place during the low season as well. Yeah. So on a slightly different note, instead of history, more, you know, myth than magic. So I know that the people of Urson Valley in the Swiss Alps have many myths about their magical region with the Devil's Bridge being the most legendary. 
what is this famous legend of Devil's Bridge? It's one of the one of the best myths uh, around, and it has to do with the gorge that you have to cross um, to get to Andamat. So it's it's used to be very very difficult to to even get to Andamat because going through that gorge um, was was so dangerous. And then they first built like like smaller wooden uh, bridges along the gorge, but not really over the gorge. But like you had to still uh, climb your way up. Um, I think a lot of people uh, died during that time and um, a lot of people also tried building really a good bridge over the gorge but um, the story goes that they always failed because it was so difficult and then they had the idea to to ask the devil for help and the devil said yeah sure I'll I'll help you but uh, in return I want to have the first soul that will cross the bridge Um, and and the people from from the Uzeron Valley said okay yeah we'll do that um, so the devil built the, built the bridge and the bridge is still standing there today. So it's uh, finally working. And then instead of, of course, uh, sending him uh, a human soul, they, they were quite clever and sent him um, a goat. And um, of course, that was not what the devil was expecting. And he got quite mad. And as the myth goes, he then tried to take a very, very big stone and, and throw it on the bridge to destroy the bridge again. But um, on the way, he met... Um, a nun and the nun um, made a cross on the, on the stone. And so um, the, the legend says that he then missed the bridge when he threw the stone. Um, and finally, you can still see the stone uh, when you're driving on the highway to Andamat. It's, a, it's really a, a big stone um, and it was actually moved when they built the highway. So um, it's, it's so important to Switzerland that they moved this big stone, I think 10 meters to the left so they can build their <laughs> highway. <laughs> There you go, upsetting the devil again by moving his big stone. (laughs) Are there any other ghost stories, myths or legends that visitors can hear about and experience when visiting Andermatt? Uh, there are a couple. So um, even before, like the the Swiss military was quite present, and and during the first and second world war, um, there was um, a, a quite a spectacular fight uh, between uh, General Suvorov from from Russia against um, troops from Napoleon in 1799, um, which was I think um, one of the first defeats for for Napoleon's troops. So that's why it's quite important um, in that war. And of course, um, he, General Suvoros, is, is uh, quite famous in Russia. And so um, they, they have a monument actually built for him um, at the bridge, which is um, actually on Russian territory. So it's, it's um, just a very small piece of Russia within Switzerland. Um, and you can visit that. So that's one thing that, that you can definitely do. And then, of course, like with all the... Um, military fortresses built during the Second World War. There's one just on top of the Gothard Pass, which is open to the public, um, which gives you just an, an, an insight on, on how people maybe really lived during that time. So they, they maybe stayed inside that cave for, for, for months and then they had uh, supplies within that, that um, cage system, cave system. And you can also see um, still the old stagecoach, um, which was used for, for the post um, to carry um, like all the letters and, and um, things from, from northern um, Switzerland towards Italy. And you can still actually ride um, it over the Gothard Pass. And then you have like a horse-drawn carriage um, and you're sitting in, inside this yellow stagecoach. Um, I heard, I've not done it myself, that it's quite... Uh, amazing because the stage court is quite high I think it's four or five meters high and you sit on the top and then you still have um like the the you'd go down the old path and it it's quite steep when you look down so it must be quite frightening <laughs> but also very exciting that sounds fun. also very exciting very unique <laughs> and then yeah that all sounds wonderful. So, so many little secrets and myths. I feel like you definitely would have to visit to see the small piece of Russia and these Devil's Bridge. That that sounds really exciting to me. I, I love stories like that. So we move on now to my favourite subject of food. And, of course, when you think of Switzerland, I mean, you mentioned that the mountains look like Swiss cheese. You obviously think of Swiss cheese. So 
obviously here in Australia, we consume cheese a little differently. We have it on our sandwich or on a little rice cracker, but cheese in Switzerland is the center of a meal. So tell us about the magical cheese eating experience that is fondue and raclette. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, both have to do with melted cheese. So it's basically two two types of, uh, of versions where you can melt cheese. The fondue, you would have the cheese in a, in a pot and, and you would melt the cheese inside the pot and then you can dip your bread or your potatoes or like, like other vegetables, whatever you like, inside the cheese and then um, eat it in that way. And, and raclette, you would um, traditionally, you would take um, a whole cheese wheel and you would um, cut it in half and then you would start melting like the, the surface that you have from cutting and then you can scrape off the cheese from, from that cheese wheel. Um, and there, of course, um, that's quite quite complicated. You, and I mean, not everyone wants to eat a whole cheese wheel. So they're like, um, the workaround is that you can also have small um, plates of cheese that you can buy in the supermarket. And then you just put them in small, um, small pans and then you heat it as well. And then you could um, have it on, on, on top of your t- potatoes as well, for example. I don't know what fool would not want to eat a whole wheel of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> and are these experiences both available uh, all in Andermatt? Are there restaurants that uh, yes. it's quite easy to so, find? Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's, of course, nothing typical Andermatt because it's, it's rather typical Swiss. You can, you can find them in a lot of places uh, throughout Switzerland, but there are definitely um, a lot of, um, small restaurants in town uh, of Andamat where you can have um, the cheese fondue or the raclette. Um, and I, I know that a lot of the hotels, for example, or like the apartments, they would have their own fondue or raclette set uh, inside the apartment. So if you're renting one of, of the apartments, you could uh, also do it uh, for yourself and, and the family. So being quite a large mixing pot of cultures in Andamat, the food must have an incredibly broad range of cuisine. What is some of the unexpected food that people may find in Andaman? I think the most unexpected thing would be the Michelin star sushi restaurant that we have. Um, it's, it's part of one of the hotels. I would um, definitely say that's has... unexpected, finding <laughs> Michelin star Japanese in the middle of the Swiss Alps. <laughs> And um, in general, the, the cuisine of, of that hotel is, is a mix of um, European and Asian. So you, um, they have two restaurants, the, the Michelin starred sushi restaurant and the other restaurant. You can, you can basically choose your, your, your meat, for example, let's say like chicken. And then you can choose if you want to have it prepared the, the traditional European or the tradi- traditional Asian way. So um, I think that's also a very interesting food concept. And then um, what's also quite special is that now there is a, a layoff of the sushi restaurant on top of the mountain. So um, the one that I mentioned in, in our first podcast on 2,400 meters with the lovely terrace, that's actually um, the same, basically the same restaurant as the sushi restaurant. Um, and, and they also have a Michelin star now. And um, there's a second restaurant next to that on top of the mountain which is focusing more on the Swiss cuisine and they also have a Michelin star. So I think a lot of people would not expect to have um, or to find three Michelin star restaurants in Andamant. And also fantastic for the thousand pop thousand people population in Andamant having three <laughs> Michelin stars. That's <laughs> awesome for you guys. <laughs> So now on the other side of unexpected items, what are some of the delicacies in Andamat that people must try? So the um, main dish or like the, the traditional dish of Andamat, it's called Ries and Boar, uh, which is like the, the local dialect and what would translate to, to rice and then leek. And um, rice in this sense is, is really more the risotto rice and, and then you would ask yourself, of course, like, how does risotto get to Andamat? Because we're on 1,400 meters. That's not, not, not really where risotto usually grows. And that's true. But because of, of um, the gorge that I mentioned in the beginning, was, that was so difficult to, to pass um, in, in the past years, 
the, the trade to the northern part of, of Switzerland was, was very difficult. And so Andamat traded a lot more and, and much longer with, with the southern parts, so like the Ticino and then also Italy. And that is why um, we can find like, like more Italian dishes like the risotto um, in Andamat today. And that's also, um, you will find more, um, yeah, even genetically, the, the people in Andamat are more related to the southern um, pe um, people than to the, to the northern people. Um, and then there are uh, other special dishes like like there are a lot of um, a lot of good sausages like these homemade pickled sausages. Um, those are I would say there's a couple of their typical andamat. So you'll definitely have a wide range of, of food, um, and, and there should be something for everyone when you when you come to andamat to try. So as we previously mentioned, andamat having a population of a little over a thousand people i'd love to hear a little bit more about the culture and the feel that the locals have especially when they get visitors during the low season because you must be able to spot the visitor a mile away because you know who everyone is obviously waving hello what is it like when people come to visit during that low season that's true um but I think people are used to to having visitors because um, before the Gothard Tunnel was built, um, the the trade route, the main trade route to to the south, was over the Gothard Pass, and then people usually stayed in Andamat before uh, continuing the journey the next day over the the dangerous pass. So um, Andamat has always been uh, open to to people traveling and and always had some kind of hospitality. So I think they are definitely used to having people. Um, coming from from different places and staying in Andamat, and uh, even if if you look at the population of Andamat today, there are a couple of people who who moved to Andamat. Um, for example, one guy he's from uh, from Iceland, and he's been living there since twenty years. So he's basically a local now as well. So so um, I, I would say they're very very open to to welcoming people, and they're always happy to to talk with you and then to tell them their stories so so if you if you are willing to learn from them and and um, have some time um, and and if you talk to them on the streets then I'm, I'm pretty sure they will not uh, say no to to talking to you and how did you yourself end up in Andamat um was a little bit by coincidence, um, but basically through through a friend that was already working in Andamat um, and and who told me of, of the opportunity and and um, I, I visited him there and um, yeah I mean it's it's a really a lovely um, area to to be working and living in so like yeah it's, it's other people go there for for their holidays and and um, yeah I, I get to work there so it's it's quite special. <laughs> I mean, you have definitely made Andamat sound wonderfully special and I'd like to give you a big thank you for joining us and teaching us about this magical, mythical place. It's been an absolute pleasure, Lars. Thank you, Kate. And um, yeah, it was my pleasure to to talk to you about Andamat and I hope um, that, that I made you and also the, the, the you guys out there curious and uh, hope to see you one day. And uh, yeah, then you can also talk to me on the streets. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, doing these podcasts are becoming harder and harder because I am adding more and more destinations to my list to travel. And Andamat is no exception to that. What a mysterious place filled with beautiful food, people and stories. Don't forget to share this podcast with your friends, family and social networks. If you want to hear about a destination, message us on our social channels at Low Season Traveller. More now than ever, travel is better without the crowds.